turn this on so I don't have to talk very loud. <laughs> I, uh, Greg's recording this because I had three or four people say they couldn't be here this afternoon and would like to hear what was said. So he, that's why the recorder is on. Not that I like being recorded. <laughs> and I'll, I'll put it up on our YouTube page. Okay. And our Facebook. So uh, the first thing I want to, as, as we postpone these, I've gotten some questions from different people. And so I've kind of changed how I thought I was going to begin. Uh, do we really even understand how the United Methodist Church works? Some of you do. You've been in it all your lives, and some of you don't. What is general conference? What does it mean when we're saying we're having a special general conference? Well, the United Methodist Church is ordered by, or general conference is the only place that makes rulings for us to be governed by. So if there's a change that needs to be made that tells the whole United Methodist Church how, what they should do or how they should handle certain situations, it is brought up before general conference. At general conference, there are delegates that are elected at each annual conference, and the annual conferences are set up uh, this is West Virginia Annual Conference, but it does not include the Eastern Panhandle. But it does include one of the um, Garrett County, Maryland. So we have one county in Maryland, but the Eastern Panhandle is not in our conference. So the annual conferences elect delegates, just much like you elect a delegate to go to the Senate or the House of Delegates in, in our state. United States government, we elect delegates, half lay people, half clergy, to go to general conference to vote on any kind of resolutions, any kind of changes that might be put up uh, to change in our, the way we do business. Okay, does that make sense? And that governing body uh, should be between 600 to 1,000 people. <coughs> In 2016, we had, I think it was oh, a little over 800 people that were sent, delegates that were sent to the annual conference. The United Methodist Church began in 1968. When the Methodist Church and the United Brethren Church merged. And so when that merger happened, there was a group that was brought together uh, to decide how, what our Book of Discipline was going to look like because it's merging two different groups and so those groups both had input on the different changes that might happen. One of the changes that happened when that was put together was we had some language added to our Book of Discipline that said that homosexuality was not in accordance with scripture and that homosexual people could not be ordained. That language had never been a part of the United Methodist Church until then. Since 1968, we've been arguing over that language and it has gotten more and more and more difficult, the struggle's gotten harder at each general conference discussing that language that was put in and having proposals come up to change that language or to uh, adapt it in some way. And so at each general <clears throat> conference since that time, there's been arguing. There's been people petitioning on one side or the other to get that language changed. There was language put in that said we accept homosexual, homosexual people. They can be a part of our congregation. They can be members of our congregation, but they still cannot be ordained or uh, we cannot marry. It's not, a, not allowed as a part of our discipline. So at the 2016 General Conference, and this United Methodist Church is global. 
We are not just uh, in the United States. We have churches in Africa, in the Philippines. We have churches all over the world. And so every one of those annual conferences sends delegates. So this vote is not just taken uh, of the churches in the United States. It's taken up worldwide. So at the 2016 General Conference, the angst, I guess would be a good word, or the discussion became so painful, so heated, so difficult, that people were being taken out of the General Conference on stretchers. People were so upset and the pressure was so strong from one side or the other of those lobbying for their side that people were having heart attacks, people were, were getting sick, the anxiety was horrible. And so there was a call for the bishops to help. Now bishops are not allowed to vote at general conference, only the delegates vote. So the bishops could not make a ruling, but the general conference petitioned them to help. Come up with a way that we can discuss this issue without this kind of heated argument. And so the bishops went, came together and came up with a plan to discuss and to work through this issue. And that was that they decided to put together a commission on the way forward. How would the United Methodist Church be moving forward to work through this one issue? And so the commission on the way forward was put together of people all over the world, uh, from every side of the argument, there were homosexual people on that commission. There were uh, straight people on the commission. There were all races on the commission. There were all, all kinds of people on this commission that has, have been coming together since 2016 to discuss the way forward. And so the bishops said that there would be a special general conference to vote on only this issue. This issue, um, whatever petitions are presented to change the Book of Discipline on this one issue would be presented at this special general conference. But the commission on the way forward would put together some plans and those plans then would be submitted as a proposed changes. So they, the Commission on the Way Forward has come up with three plans. And in those three plans, there are, there's a book, a book. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Commission on the Way Forward's uh, information. And our bishop has told us that if you really want to know what these plans have in them, you have to read this. Because the United Methodist News Service, all, a lot of other news services, have put out information that's slanted one way or the other. Uh, you can tell, when you watch news channels, can you not tell if it's a Democrat or Republican news channel? Well, the, the United Methodist News Service has some of those same slants. So whether you're listening to one side or the other is going to depend on which service you're reading or listening to. So the bishop said, if you want to know what's going on, this book is available online. Print it, get on there, read it. It's the only way you'll know exactly what's in this plan. <coughs> And so she's told us that any information that comes out had to be signed by one of the people on the Commission on the Way Forward. If it has any other byline of who wrote it, it is not official. So be very careful as to what you're reading or listening to, whether it's propaganda of one side of the lobbyists or another, or 
it is official information. You understand what the difference is now in the propaganda and the official? Okay, so you want to make sure what you're reading or listening to is the exact information. Uh, what I've in these commission uh, in these plans, there are all kinds of petitions. Okay, so this is to amend number 422 as follows. So in these three plans, there are, I believe, 48 proposed amendments to the, to the Book of Discipline. Any of us can send a resolution to the General Conference to be considered. So if you decide you're a voting member of the United Methodist Church and you decide you want to put together a proposal, you are within your rights to do that. And usually at General Conference, the General Conference comes together and meets, and there are little committees put together to review all of these proposals that come in to the General Conference for consideration. And so there's, there are little groups that meet that consider all of these proposals and decide if, if they're legal or not if they're allowed to go before the General Conference for official vote, but if they have language in them that's not gonna be legal in our uh, system, then, then those are set aside, and so then those are put uh, before the General Conference main body. This General Conference is only three days, and so there's been a body, uh, a council that's been put together to look at all the proposed amendments that are being sent in and decide if they are in accordance with the United Methodist discipline. If they're going against our Constitution or not. So if they go against the Constitution, then those are voted that they cannot be presented to this general conference. So at this point, there are 78 petitions that have been approved. So this general conference is three days long and they have 78 petitions before them to be considered. <coughs> so that's why we're being asked to pray and pray strongly because this is very serious and very difficult <coughs> information to process. They have all this that they're to read and to process and and look at before they get there. But it's still a very difficult task. Very difficult. I'm glad I'm not going to general conference. <laughs> <laughs> I would hate to have that on my shoulders. This is a very difficult issue. It's a very painful issue for many people. On both sides. And so, one of the new services main headline <coughs> says unity struggle is a major story for 2018 that means that this struggle this pain has caused the most articles to be written about in the United Methodist News Service of any kind throughout this past year <coughs> there's all kinds of stuff that's been put out there but it is a it's a it's an issue that we're all interested in. I, I'm surprised that there are not more people here. Um, I haven't brought this before you until now because I think this issue has derailed the church from our main purpose. And I think our main purpose is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I don't want us to get stuck fighting over something other than that. I want us to be focused on our main purpose. And so I haven't brought this before our congregation. There are, there are pastors who bring it up every Sunday. But I don't, I don't think that's where we're, why we're here. I believe that I'm bringing it before you now because I think you need to know what's happening and it needs to be shared.
but it's not shared for a purpose of arguing about it. Does that make sense? Any of the rest of you who've been to the bishop's presentations, did I miss anything or not say something correctly, Patsy, Tom? Mm -hmm. Okay. Pray, pray at 2.23 every day because that's the first day of general conference is February 23rd. It's not, okay. So uh, that's one of the main things that they've asked us to do is to pray. Um, so it is a, it's a topic that, that needs to be discussed. I'm not, not saying that it doesn't need to be discussed. I just don't want it to derail us. Do you all understand what I'm saying? Okay. One of the things I want us to think about, main number one thing I think needs to be said when we're discussing this kind of thing. Scripture is interpreted differently by different people. Does that amaze you? <laughs> why? If it says what it says, why is it interpreted differently? I've had people ask me that. Well, I want you to think about this. Keith and I, when we hear a story or we read something, we come away from that interpreting it two different ways. Any of the rest of that happen in your family? If I hear a story, someone says that they bought a new car and they give all the information about that new car, Keith comes home and he heard that Tom just bought a new Jeep with a V6 engine, with an engine block heater, with an eight-speed automatic transmission. I came away from that saying that Tom bought a new Jeep with a Bose radio with heated seats and lighted cup holders. <laughs> Do you understand? Because that's what's important to me. One lady I knew said that she uh, picked out their whole vehicle by looking for lighted cup holders. <laughs> That's the only thing she was looking for. Now, would you men pick out a vehicle determined by cup holders? Very few of you would even notice the cup holders, right? So when we're, when we're talking about Scripture, when we're talking about things that we read in the Scriptures, we all still pick up on different things. Different things say different things to all of us as we read them. And did either one of us tell the story incorrectly when we're talking about Tom's Jeep? No, we told it differently. Not incorrectly, we told it differently. But both parts were right. We just told it differently. One of the things that is so, so important to me, and it comes from my background, I think interpretation of scripture is very, very important. It's very important to all of us. But in my background, there were personal interpretations that split my father and mother from me. My dad, interpreting scripture, says that we should have communion every Sunday. Scripture does say we met and broke bread on the first day of the week. And so thus my dad interpreted that to say that when you meet, you will break bread each time you meet. And if you don't break bread, then you're not in line with the scripture. So, when I went to a church that did not serve communion every Sunday, my dad determined that I'm going to hell. Because he believes it's that important. I didn't interpret it that way. I interpreted it that it's very important for us 
to break bread together, to have communion together, but it's not dependent on whether I go to heaven or hell if I don't have it every Sunday. So those two different interpretations, uh, and there was more things than that, but those, those kinds of different interpretations almost destroyed our relationship. When I left the church that I grew up in, my parents didn't speak to me for over a year. My aunt walked past me, or drove past me on the little road that we lived on one day and turned her head and wouldn't look at me. All based on difference in interpretation of scripture. That's why it's so important to me to look at all sides of the story and not try to hurt each other and rip each other apart and not love each other because we don't think the same way. It's too painful and it's unnecessary. That's why it's very important to me. I came to my conclusion that I wasn't going to hell because I began to study the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians is where anybody should start when they're talking about whether we're following the law or following grace. Does the law take us to heaven or hell? Or does grace? God says, I look upon the heart of man and not what you're doing out here. Not that this is not important. Your heart should drive what's going on out here. But what God looks at is the heart. And what I finally came to the conclusion, uh, and I was angry at my dad for saying those things at me, and I didn't want anything to do with him either. But I finally came to the conclusion that my dad loved the Lord God with his whole heart. And he wanted what's best for me and what was best for him. And I love the Lord God with my whole heart. And I wanted the best for me and the best for anyone God had called me to serve. And so both of us are loving the Lord God with our whole heart, even though we interpret things differently on a lot of levels. But what was most important? The way we interpreted the law or our heart? I decided that both of us are going to make it. <laughs> I believe that when we get there, Dad will be waiting. I believe that's very important. The, the people in the scriptures that were in arguments. They were arguing over circumcision, remember? God had said to the Jewish people, you have to be circumcised. And if you're not circumcised, then you're not a part of the Jewish tradition, right? And if you're converted in, then you're circumcised at that point. So circumcision was a very important part of their religious tradition. But when the new church came in, these people were being converted, but they weren't being circumcised. And so they're not really a part of it, are they? That was the argument that was going on in several of the scriptures. And so Paul is trying to address that, and he's saying, it's, it's not circumcision, it's that, that doesn't matter. That's not what this is all about, circumcised or uncircumcised, you're both okay. The, the thing is about your heart. Where's your heart? And that's what's most important. In all of the arguments you find in Corinthians and Galatians, all of those books that, that Paul is talking about, he goes back to the same thing. You're not going to make it on following the law. You're going to make it because your heart is focused on Jesus Christ. And so I think that's what needs to go over all of our discussions 
on anything pertaining to the law. The law is important. The law should be interpreted at the best we can. But it should not supersede how we love each other. We should still be able, my dad and I should still be able to love each other. That's what the conclusion I came to. God would be more upset that we didn't love each other than it was that we had different interpretations of the law. So that's what I want us to understand before we get into any discussions. And any discussions on what our, our book of discipline should say regarding homosexuality. The scripture in the New Testament that talks about homosexuality is found in Romans chapter 1. Most of you have probably read that, right? And Paul says to the Gentile people, or to the people he's talking to, that lying man with man and woman with woman was not, not what, what they should be doing. But Romans chapter 2 should not be left off of that story. He's telling that story and then says, but. So what's but mean when you have a story? He's saying, you all say that these things are wrong. And then they are. But. But, so every single one of you who judge an others is without any excuse. You condemn yourself when you judge another person because the one who is judging is doing the same things. We know that God judge, God's judgment agrees with the truth and his judgment is against those who do these kinds of things. If you judge those who do this, these kinds of things while you are doing the same thing yourself, think about this. Do you believe that you will escape God's judgment? Or do you have contempt for the riches of God's generosity, tolerance, and patience? So if we're sinning ourselves, we better be careful. That's the whole story in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2. So different people have interpreted those things differently. Some have stuck to chapter 1 and said it says that this is wrong and it is wrong. Some have, and this is things I've heard, I'm not uh, telling you what all the interpretations are, but some have said that Paul is talking about Roman baths, Roman bathhouses where men and women were all together in one big room and they were all doing all kinds of things. Not that I want on this video. <laughs> so Paul is saying to go into one of those bathhouses and do all those kinds of things is very wrong. But be careful that you're not judging because you are doing sin sinful things yourself. So they say that just like women in ministry, where Timothy says women should not be heard in the church, that is contextual, that is according to the context of that time, this same scripture is according to the context of that time. We don't have bathhouses anymore, right? Not in the United States anyway. I haven't seen it. Well, we have, some, we have some houses. We're not going to discuss those, are we? <laughs> so, but he's, he's, they're saying that that's contextual. And that that scripture can't be interpreted in today's society the same way it was interpreted to the people that Paul was talking to. And I heard someone say, so if two people are living together in a monogamous relationship... Two people who love each other. They're not in a bathhouse going with every other person and every, every other kind of thing. If they're loving each other, isn't that different? I'm telling you, 
that I don't know the answer. I've been struggling with this answer for many years myself. I don't know the answer. The only thing I've gotten in my prayers on this issue are we all see through a glass darkly. And it's very difficult to understand. I don't understand it. I haven't felt called to change any part of my life. I haven't felt called to marry a same-sex relationship. I haven't felt called to change that in my own life. But I still have to admit, I don't understand it. That's where I am with this issue. And that's where a lot of people are. The bishop said that in the United Methodist Church surveys that have been taken or people that they've talked to, the majority of the United Methodist Church is in the middle of that argument. And there are people on either end that are causing this painful argument. There are people over here that says, no way you're going to hell if you do this. And there are people over here that are saying, no way you're going to hell if you don't. And these two ends are causing severe pain and angst in the whole uh, church. And so they're trying to decide a way forward. Do we cut off both ends <laughs> and, and take the majority of the people and move forward? How do we handle this? And I know that wasn't their discussion, <laughs> but that's kind of the, the conclusion or the, the where they started. How do we handle this? Do we say that those who believe you have to ordain uh, homosexual people or you're going to hell, do we say they need to move on? Or do those over here who say, if you do ordain homosexual people, you're going to hell, and do we need to ask them to move on? And the middle that's saying, we're seeing through a glass darkly here. We're not sure where God's taking us. We're not sure exactly where we stand on all this. We're letting God lead us. Do we allow those people to move forward as a, and move forward with the United Methodist Church? That's kind of the question that they discussed. And I've given it to you in Cindy Echo language, not, not official language. So that's, that's the discussion that came up with three plans. How do we move forward? In the three plans, and I was just gonna discuss scripture today, but we've kind of gotten behind with being off a couple of weeks. So we're gonna dig into this information. The first plan that's listed in this, in this uh, book is the one church plan. The one church plan gives churches the room they need to maximize the presence of the United Methodist Church witness in as many places in the world as possible. The one church plan removes the, from the, removes the language from the book of discipline used in the United States that restricts pastors and churches from conducting same-sex weddings. And annual conferences from a door, ordaining same self-avowed practicing homosexual persons. It adds language that intentionally protects the religious freedom of pastors and churches who choose not to perform or host same-sex weddings and board of ordained ministries and bishops who choose not to credential or ordain self-avowed practicing homosexual persons. The plan ends the threat of church trials over same-sex weddings. Boards of ordained ministry already have the authority to, to discern who's gonna be credentialed or ordained or not. Local churches already have the authority to establish their wedding policies. So you as a church have the ability to establish your wedding policies. Pastors already discern 
to whom they will marry and whom they will not. While some annual conferences and related boards of ordained ministry can adopt new practices, no annual conference must make further choices or amend current practices until they desire to do so. Does it, does it make sense so far? So each jurisdictional conference or area will support the costs of its own Episcopal leaders and officers. Right now, our apportionments uh, go into the Episcopal fund, part of our apportionments, and those apportionments are divided and pay the, the bishop's salary all over the general conference, all over the world. Every bishop earns the same salary all over the world. And that main pot pays for those salaries. This plan would change that and each jurisdictional conference would pay its own Episcopal leaders. So that if this jurisdiction, or if this conference over here votes that they have uh, homosexual clergy and homosexual bishops and you don't agree with that, then your money would not pay their salary. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so in this plan, that would be uh, how that was handled. So there wouldn't be a church vote per se on whether you're gonna let homosexuals be in your church um, when a pastor, pastor does a profile on how, what kind of church we think we could serve. So when you're, you get a new pastor, the, the uh, board of cabinet goes through those profiles and tries to pray and pick out a pastor that they think matches your profile. So when you're up for a new pastor, the DS comes here and asks the uh, pastor parish committee to help them put together a profile of what this church believes, what this church stands for. And they try very hard to match those profiles so that they're bringing in a pastor that matches what you believe and what you think and what you want. So that profiling process would be what's used to discern on whether a pastor who has chosen to marry same-sex marriages would not be matched with a church that doesn't want that. There wouldn't be a church vote. It would, it, that kind of thing would be done in profiling. And that kind of thing would be done through the vote on how you set your wedding policies. Do you understand that? Does that all make sense? Okay, so that's the one church plan. It just takes out the language and it puts all of that in the hands of each church, each annual conference. The annual conference is the one uh, they put together a board of ordained ministry and that board of ordained ministry meets with the pastors that are up for ordination and interviews each pastor twice, once before you go into residency, and then after three years, you go back before the board and are, are interviewed again. That board decides who's ordained and who's not. So that board in each annual conference would have rules on whether that annual conference will allow uh, homosexuals to be ordained or not. So a lot of those decisions would be made at the annual conference level, the church level, and then, then at the pastoral level. That's the one church plan, but it would keep together <coughs> all of the uh, pension monies, the insurance monies, uh, all of the general boards would stay as they are. So none of that would change. It just takes out the language, basically, and then puts, um, each annual conference can discern, and, and then each church can discern, and then each pastor can discern. But it keeps the church as one. It gives um, pastors the ability to move from one conference to the other. If West Virginia Annual Conference votes that, or decides that it's going to, um, ordain homosexuals and I don't believe in that 
that has given me an option to move to a different conference. And it would help us to do that. Uh, sometimes right now, if I say I want a church in Florida, they're going to really question me as to why I want to go to Florida. And then the bishop can decide whether she'll prove that or not. So I don't really have the option to jump across conferences right now. But this plan would give you an opportunity to move uh, conferences based on how a conference stands. It would also give churches the uh, ability to um, opt out. And it's going to allow them to... Uh, United Methodist Church owns the buildings. The conference uh, owns this building. And so if any changes are made to this building, you know you have to get your plans approved through the uh, building committee for the annual conference because the annual conference is responsible to pay for it if you don't. So all of that has to get approved. So the annual conference owns the church buildings. They're the ones that are on the line for the final bill if something happens here. So this plan also gives a, a way out that says your building can be yours. Everything can be yours if you vote that you no longer want to be United Methodist because you don't like this plan. And you can move forward into a non-denominational church if that's what you decide you want to do or uh, join another group that might be formed out of this. So they're, they're going to ask that you pay a, a fee, an apportioned fee, to help cover Episcopal uh, pensions or pensions, Episcopal payments that should be paid up until a certain point. I'm not sure where that point is or what, what um, they're going to decide on how much that money is. It doesn't really give exact ways that they're going to form that uh, amount. But you'll be, uh, the church will be asked to pay certain fees that should be owed already, and then you're allowed to take your building and move in any direction you want. So it gives those options. The one church plan is the plan that's been, uh, I can't say promoted, it's been the council or the committee on the way forward, this is the plan that they voted is their choice. This, it, uh, it's not the commission on the way forward, it's the council of bishops. So the council of bishops have come together and chosen one of these plans because they've been asked to, uh, that, that, that they would prefer for us. Now the council of bishops, there are different bishops that believe different things, but they've come together and said that this is their preferred plan for our church. Plan number two is the Connectional Conference Plan. Now the Connectional Conference, in the, United, in the United States we have five jurisdictional conferences. So we are in the <coughs> Northeastern jurisdiction. So uh, those ju jurisdictional conferences also meet and decide things that would happen within our jurisdiction. And we vote, those bishops, our bishops come out of our jurisdiction. They meet and vote on who's going to be uh, elected to bishop. And so that's one of the things that the jurisdictional conference does. But in this connectional conference plan, Jurisdictional conferences would be done away with, and there would be connectional conferences. There would be three in the United States. And the connectional conferences would be set up depending on whether you want to ordain homosexuals or not ordain homosexuals. There would be three different choices. And each church each conference, each pastor can vote on which connectional conference they want to be a part of. I think, doesn't the Presbyterian Church have two 
two groups that you can belong to. I mean, I'm not the Missouri Synod, and I don't really understand which one's which, but uh, this Presbyterian church here is a different of a different synod than the one over on 19th Street. Or the Presbyterian's not on 19th, it's down on, on uh, the end of Market Street, <laughs> or the end of 13th there. And, but the Presbyterian church has different synods. That's, this one's Lutheran, isn't it? <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. It's not Presbyterian, it's Lutheran. This Lutheran church is different than the one on 19th Street. And so I think it's going to be similar to that, even though I don't fully understand what the synods are or how those are divided. But it has to do with one being more conservative than the other. So this, this would be a connectional conference that puts uh, together the churches depending on their belief on this issue. So the general agencies would be decided on each connectional conference. Uh, whether you desire to stay a part of the general agencies that we already have or put together different agencies. And the agent, if you want to be a part of the general board of missions or general board of discipleship, uh, you would pay a fee to belong to that and to have them to help continue to support or to do work for you. So those connectional conferences, each one would have its own policies regarding weddings and ordination. Each connectional conference would set its own standards for ministerial credentials and uh, they would have a list of approved schools or seminaries that their, their pastors could go to depending on whether they were conservative or liberal in their beliefs. So that, that's the basis of what a, the, the second plan is called the Connectional Conference Plan. From what I've heard, just that's not an official word, this is the most difficult plan to put in place. And it would take the longest time period to put it in place because it's gonna take a lot of work to decide who's going where. And you could have Stout in one connectional conference and you could have St. Andrews in another. So each church would decide what conference they want to be a part of. Uh, some people have felt that this is the way we should go. But the, the Council of Bishops, uh, this was not their preferred <laughs> Plan. The third plan is called the traditionalist plan. And this plan <coughs> says that we're going to keep the language that's currently in the Book of Discipline regarding this issue and that the accountability for keeping, uh, keeping those guidelines would be even made stronger. So right now there would there have been some pastors who have uh, married same-sex marriages and they have not been thrown out of the United Methodist Church. Uh, we have currently in Oregon, Washington, a, a lesbian bishop who has been elected as a bishop in that, that conference or that and they love her, and they don't have any problem with that in their area and their churches, and she's not been brought up on charges. No one has brought charges against her or that area. And so this traditionalist plan would say, 